Robin asks, why have different flavors of SegWit addresses? My wallets now give me the option to pick from either legacy, batch 32, or P2SH addresses. As I understand it, I want to have private keys to be SegWit-enabled addresses, so that less data needs to be paid for to publish on the blockchain. Now that both have been implemented for a while, is there a winner yet, or what is the benefit of being different and incompatible? It is not really a matter of winner or better, it is really a historical progression. Legacy addresses, meaning those that start with a 1, um, are not SegWit-enabled, meaning that you cannot um, use a segregated witness signature in order to publish a transaction from an address that begins with 1. Uh, that is going to increase the fees that you have to pay to uh, make a transaction, pay a transaction from an address that starts with 1. Um, the second class of addresses you mentioned are P2SH. Uh, P2SH are addresses that start with a 3. And these are scripts wrapped uh, in a pay-to-script hash. And, uh, addresses that start with a 3 can be a variety of things. You may have uh, heard of them being referred to as multi-sig addresses in the past. That is because that was the main use uh, for 3 addresses, was multi-sig, the most common script used. But they can be anything. Uh, they can be lightning endpoints, which can also be expressed as P2SH addresses, of course. Um, they can also be SegWit scripts. And if they're SegWit scripts, that particular formulation is called uh, P2SH wrapped P2WPKH, or um, to break that up a bit, that's a pay to witness public key hash, which is a, a native witness address or SegWit address. Um, wrapped inside a script and expressed as a pay-to-script hash, which is why it has a three and it looks like an old multi-sig address. And these are kind of a bridge. These are addresses that can be recognized by any wallet without any upgrade. So they give you the benefit of spending with a SegWit transaction or spending the inputs with a SegWit signature, um, which reduces your fees but are accepted by any wallet um, as a destination address, because they are P2SH. So old wallets don't need to know anything about SegWit in order to pay to them. Um, and that makes it easier to upgrade to SegWit transactions um, without having to expect everybody to upgrade their wallet. But that comes at a price. And the price is, because you have the script wrapping, the P2SH wrapping, it makes the, the signatures uh, a bit larger, uh, quite a bit larger, in fact, than native SegWits. Uh, so it's better than legacy, but not as good as native SegWit. Batch 32 addresses that begin with BC1 are the ultimate goal. Those are native SegWit addresses. Um, they, they don't have any of the fluff around them. They're basically just a SegWit v0 script. Um, and that SegWit v0 script is the shortest, most compact way to express a SegWit address. It allows you to spend using segregated witness signatures, which reduces your fees. Um, and, uh, it takes up less space than a P2SH wrapped uh, SegWit address. However, in order to implement in order to get paid to a BC1 address, the person paying you needs to have a wallet that has been upgraded to identify native SegWit addresses as valid Bitcoin addresses. And so that means you have to wait for people to upgrade. Now, I would say we're probably at about 50% coverage right now, and that's just a wild guess based on my experience. But about half the wallets I see out there now support paying to a Betch32 address which makes it easier than using um, uh, it, it, it makes it uh, easier to use a batch 32 address nowadays um, but it still means that some of the customers you might have or some of the people you may want to get payments from uh, will have a problem their wallet will not be able uh, to pay to a batch 32 address because it hasn't been upgraded so what should you do? you should gradually try to upgrade all of your interactions to using native SegWit batch 32 addresses. They are easier to read, they are easier to transcribe, um, they have better error correction and error detection capabilities than uh, base 58 encoded traditional addresses. They have more compact signatures and more compact scripts. They save you on fees. 
but you have to wait for the wallet manufacturers to upgrade. And so th this is a difficult decision. It depends on how broad um, of an audience you have for making payments, right? So if you're running an e-commerce store, for example, and you're selling stuff to the general public, and you expect people to come with a hundred different wallets, um, then you may want to stick to PT P2SH wrapped SegWit addresses just to ensure that everybody will be able to make a purchase on your store. They don't need an upgraded wallet. If you're dealing with a smaller circle of people, most of whom are more advanced, early adopter users who have more sophisticated wallets, then you may be able to upgrade to native SegWit Batch32 addresses sooner. Um, and I have a combination. I have some wallets that are Batch32. I have some wallets that, that use P2SH wrapped SegWit. I even have some wallets that use legacy addresses still. Um, and uh, that way I use the right wallet for the right job. George asks about the space gain of Schnorr signatures. What is the percentage space gain that we should expect with Schnorr signatures? It actually depends on a number of different factors, because there's two places in which Schnorr signatures create space gains. The first one is the signature itself. Uh, Schnorr signatures are simply shorter than ECDSA uh, signatures. So you automatically get, and I think it's somewhere between a 15 and 20 percent reduction in the space required to encode Schnorr signatures. Furthermore, most of the proposals for Schnorr signatures also include a change in the way the signature is encoded. Today on the Bitcoin blockchain, signatures are encoded using a uh, uh, DER encoding, DER encoding, DER, and that's not space efficient because it, it doesn't matter in most of the applications for digital signatures. Space wasn't a consideration. On a blockchain, it is. It's a very big consideration. So the DER encoding we use for ECDSA is already has some room for improvement. Uh, and then Schnorr signatures are more compact. So those two efficiencies together. With an introduction of Schnorr signatures, we change the encoding, and um, and the signature itself is shorter, 15 to 20 percent gain from there. But there's additional gains because one of the things that you can do with Schnorr signatures is signature aggregation. So instead of, for example, having a signature on every input in your transaction, if you have a transaction that say has two or three inputs. Now you need three signatures, one per input, and each of those signatures will take up, you know, thirty some bytes of signature space. With Schnorr, what you can do is you can produce one signature that is an aggregate signature for all three inputs. That's a sixty-six percent reduction in space because you've now replaced three signatures by one. Um, and that signature can be computed by yourself if you have three inputs that all belong to you. But you can also do uh, some forms of multi-party computation in order to produce an aggregate signature for inputs that are not owned by the same person. For example, in the case of a coin join or other uh, multi-party transaction. Then there is a possibility of doing aggregation across transactions, which is a, uh, an even more ambitious goal. And theoretically, at least, uh, you could do one aggregated trans, uh, signature for an entire block. Uh, that has its own complications, not easy to implement. Uh, that would be a huge space gain. So, uh, it depends how Schnorr signatures are applied. At minimum, 15 percent in space savings, probably close to 30, and with just transaction level aggregation, another 50 or 60 percent. Uh, reduction in space because of Schnorr signatures. The follow-up question from George to that would be, would you vote, therefore, to lower the block size when you have the implementation of Schnorr? And I think not. Um, I think that, um, that, in fact, this gives us an opportunity to effectively increase the capacity of the blockchain without increasing the base block size. I don't want to go backwards in that, but that's a personal opinion, and it's not a very strong personal opinion. Um, it's one that I am be open to persuasion. I don't currently buy the argument that the reason people are not running more full nodes is because of the bandwidth and disk costs uh, of the current one megabyte uh, base block size or um, four megabyte block weight uh, that exists in, block in, in Bitcoin's blockchain. 
Uh, so therefore, I don't think that's a huge problem today. And therefore, I don't think we need a radical solution like a reduction in the block size, which most people who propose this are talking about a temporary soft fork. Still, uh, I don't really see the need for that, but I, I could be persuaded otherwise. Santiago asks, what is Taproot, a code change designed to increase Bitcoin's privacy? I'd like to know more about the Taproot soft fork upgrade proposed by Peter Wool. Um, how does it work, and what are its differences compared to zero-knowledge proofs uh, or other approaches being explored, uh, for example, by Ethereum? So Taproot is very different from a zero-knowledge proof. Um, it's not really a direct privacy um, solution uh, as zero-knowledge proofs are. What it does is it makes it erases the distinction between a, uh, a payment to a public key and a payment to a script. So at, at the moment on the Bitcoin blockchain, you can distinguish between payments to public keys or public key hashes, pay to PKH as they're called, uh, because they start with a one. So one addresses are simple Bitcoin public key addresses or double hashes of public keys. Um, and addresses that start with a three are a script. Now that might be a multisig, which is the most common uh, example. A lot of people think that that's a multisig. It might be SegWit wrapped in a script, uh, or it might be some other script, like for example a Lightning channel. Um, but you can tell the difference between a script and a public key. What Taproot does is it erases that distinction. It makes um, all scripts and public key payments look the same when they are submitted on the network. And when you try to spend them, then you can either choose to spend with a public key or spend with a script. Um, and not just a script, but actually a, a Merkle tree of, of multiple script clauses of which you only reveal one. So you can either spend it as a public key with a regular signature, or you can spend it as uh, by revealing part of a script that's in a Merkle tree. This is really interesting because it creates uh, a situation where all payments look the same. You no longer distinguish between scripts and public keys. And there's a, a very interesting fact here that because of the way Schnorr signatures work, which is combined in this proposal, um, or, or which has been proposed simultaneously with Taproot, with Schnorr signatures you can do um, you can do additive signatures. And what that means is, um, let's say you have a three of three multisig, and um, all three people agree to spend it. Well, in traditional terms, you would have to do a, a, a three of three multisig spend, which is a script presenting three public keys and three signatures for everybody to see. Everybody knows it's a three of three. When you spend it, it's going to be very visible. But with Schnorr signatures, what you can do is you can take the three public keys, collaboratively join them together, essentially adding them together, and create an, um, a master public key, if you like, and then add all of the signatures together and create a master signature. So the three parties can sign the public key of their joint public keys with a signature that is their joint signature. And then it looks like a straightforward payment to a public key. You don't know it's a three of three multisig because they all agree to spend it. And there are many, many scripts in which um, you have various thresholds or conditions. But if all of the participants agree, you can just do a joint signature like that and make it look like a simple payment to a public key with a simple signature. So the combination of these Schnorr additive signatures and Taproot then makes it for very interesting uh, obfuscation technology. It's not directly related. It's not a direct solution to privacy. It's a it's an indirect solution to privacy. It allows you to do other things to enhance your privacy too. Um, so so that's a very exciting proposal. Uh, another key another typical example here would be um, closing a lightning channel and uh, making a payment to the two participants. Now. A uh, lightning channel is a two of two multisig, but in most cases, the two parties that are participating in the lightning channel close it cooperatively. Well, instead of closing it with this massive script that says, "Here, this was a lightning channel, and we're exercising the cooperative close script," 
Um, what they do is they just join their signatures, present it as a taproot public key and a signature, and then it looks like somebody just spent that input with a regular signature to two addresses. Um, and you can't even tell it's a lightning channel. So that's what Taproot is. It, it's part of a bundle of proposals, Taproot, TapScript, which is an upgrade to the scripting language, and Schnorr signatures that have been proposed uh, to be launched together. Um, the BIPs were written by Peter Wolle, but they actually are uh, the effort of multiple uh, developers. Peter Wolle did the uh, reference implementation to, to, to demonstrate how it would work. And if uh, uh, this would be um, a soft fork upgrade uh, as SegWit V1, uh, SegWit V0 was the one that was launched in August of 2017, the first version of SegWit. Uh, we always start indexing from zero in this case. And the second version of SegWit would be SegWit V1, maybe launched in the next couple of years, would be something along the lines of Taproot, TapScript, and Schnorr signatures. Now, on a side, if you are interested in hearing more about that, uh, we just recorded an, a great podcast with Let's Talk Bitcoin uh, with uh, guests uh, Jonas Snick and Peter Wooler, and we talked extensively about what Taproot is, what TapScript is, what Schnorr is, and the impact these proposals will have on both scaling and privacy. You can catch that in episodes 400 and 401 of the Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast. We won't put that in the Q&A, but for the people watching the live, you might enjoy listening to those a lot more. We spent an hour talking about this topic. Privacy timelines. Craig asks, it sounds like, fortunately, Bitcoin will become anonymous once different upgrades are made. Could you give us the timelines of when Schnorr signatures, confidential transactions, taproots, and graft roots will go online in Bitcoin? Will this give total anonymity or will further upgrades be necessary? And if you know, when will they come about? Uh, Craig, I wish I could share your optimism. Um, it takes a lot of different approaches to achieve privacy, and privacy is an ever-moving target because you've got to think about this in terms of an adversarial arms race, meaning that while people are building privacy-defeating technologies, developers in Bitcoin are building privacy technologies, and of course, in many other um, open blockchains, especially those that are privacy-focused. Um, so, if, if we have better privacy technology in Bitcoin, then that then gives all of the incentives for the um, surveillance companies and the analytics companies to uh, continue to violate the privacy of millions of people by escalating their capabilities. And of course, when they invent something new, that then becomes the new state of the art, which very quickly leaks or gets shared, um, so that uh, of course you can't have just the good guys using surveillance technology. Uh, in fact, the bad guys uh, are the ones using surveillance technology. But that goes from the bad guys to the worst guys to the even worse guys to the dictators and murderers and brutal regimes. So one of the problems with this is that the arms race causes this escalation of technology that falls into worse and worse hands. So um, yes, we're looking at a number of technologies to improve the privacy of Bitcoin. Schnorr signatures uh, is a bit helpful, especially with threshold uh, signing, as I mentioned in the previous answer. Uh, Taproot and Graftroot. Uh, Taproot is likely to be implemented sooner. Graftroot maybe a bit later. A uh, confidential transaction is not currently scheduled for an implementation. It hasn't been uh, finalized as a BIP. It uh, currently is being tested on the Elements sidechain, but not on Bitcoin. So, will this give total anonymity? No, absolutely not. Uh, and you would need to combine these techniques with uh, various forms of coin join uh, and other privacy techniques, like, for example. Um, how wallets use change addresses, how they order outputs, uh, what fingerprints they leave as to the transactions they are constructing, preferably avoiding uh, leaving any 
uh, fingerprints, how they do things like deterministic signing and things like that. All of these um, activities increase privacy. The more you do, the fewer fingerprints you leave in the transaction, the harder it is to identify what kind of wallet was used, which means you can do less statistical analysis. And of course, if you can use various forms of confidential transactions, encryption, coin join, etc., it makes it even better. Um, I expect that there will be a fair degree of pushback against um, strong privacy in Bitcoin. I think it's a big battle that we need to fight. Um, and I think that we need to win that battle, because if we don't have uh, stronger privacy in Bitcoin, that gives, uh, that gives many uh, different attackers a way to attack Bitcoin users by violating their privacy and punishing them for using uh, Bitcoin by revealing their identities, which weakens, of course, Bitcoin. So I hope we'll see more and more upgrades in the future, but this is not going to be easy. And more importantly, it's not going to end. Um, we're going to need to keep increasing the privacy efforts as we learn more and as the attacks against privacy become more sophisticated. This is a continuous arms race.